Thank you very much, Program Director, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, special notice members of the DMPR, uh, members of the Mine Health and Safety Council, in particular the Chairman, Mr. David Caesar, colleagues from organised labour, industry, as well as the Minerals Council. I think this session was entitled Successes in the Industry. Uh, I certainly can't stand here today and talk about successes until such time as we have eliminated fatal incidents from all of our operations. However, I am very privileged and thank you for the opportunity to engage with you on the journey that we've been on over the last few years. And let me just kick off by saying this has been a traumatic journey for us as a company. We sit in summits like this and we look at graphs, we look at safety statistics, we look at trends and comment on whether we're doing better or worse. But sometimes we forget that behind each one of those numbers is not an employee, not a union member, not a mine worker, but a person. A mother, a father, a son, a daughter, brother, sister. And the way we can most honor them is by ensuring that we take and learn from those incidents and ensure that they never happen again. In our safety journey, we've had two very tragic years, both of which I think resulted in an inflection point on our safety journey. The first was in 2018. Tragically, we lost 24 colleagues within our business. There were two incidents that resulted in 13 losses of colleagues, one a seismic incident and another one colleagues who walked into an abandoned mining area and were overcome by heat. Following those two incidents, we opened our doors to safety experts from around the world, academics, some of the best consulting companies, peer companies, and asked them to come and engage with us and help us understand what we were getting wrong. And what came out of that was something we called the zero harm strategic framework. And that framework was based on three pillars, empowered people, an enabled working environment, and world-class safety systems. At the time this was developed, it was cutting edge. It was the best that had come out of any of the academic arenas. It was on the best practice across the world. And in 2019, it certainly had an impact. It was in fact the only year that our gold operations went fatal free ever. Very sadly, in 2020, we saw deterioration. And in 2021, we had yet another tragic year. 21 loss of lives across our business was unacceptable. 19 of which were in South Africa. We again opened our doors to get criticism, to get help, to get advice. And from that came two big learnings. And I hope that these are two learnings that anybody else in this audience can take without having to suffer the tragedy that ourselves, our colleagues and their family suffered in that year. The first one was our zero harm framework was world class in terms of the standards that applies, the processes, the protocols. We had all the posters on the walls with all the right language. We could speak about it in meetings. It was not being lived on our operations. We had what we call the wink wink culture. We all knew what we should be doing, but as soon as we got underground, wink wink, we do something different. It was not being lived by our teams and that is indictment on our management and our leadership of not driving a safety culture. The second big learning that came in from it, and this in fact is a learning that I see is currently being adopted by the ICMM, was that the strategy was so comprehensive it focused on everything. And there is a saying that if everything is important, then nothing's important. To get to zero harm, we first had to eliminate fatal incidents. We cannot talk about zero harm if we're still having fatal incidents occurring on our operations. So our focus shifted. And today our journey has been on eliminating fatals, focusing on the high risk incidents that result in fatal incidents. And that is what I'll take you through today. I think as an industry, we're extremely fortunate. We're not starting this journey new. Many have been on this before us. We have world-class institutions that have studied safety, best practices done by peers. And safety is the one area in this industry where we share everything. We all have one common objective. So we were able to leverage off a lot of that and the process that we followed is one that has been endorsed by the ICMM. And I'll work through it step by step, bearing in mind that what we wanted to do was embed this amongst our organization and being lived by every single one of our employees. So step one was to go to our general managers, VPs as we call them in Savannah, and ask them what are the major risks that have resulted in most of your fatal incidents? And fascinating that came out of that was two mines right next door to each other, very similar conditions, came up with different risks. 
We took all of that work and combined it, and from there, we defined 16 risks that resulted in 80% of the fatal incidents we experienced. We took those 16 risks and we benchmarked them in South Africa against South African peers, global peers, ICMM standards, and we came up with another three. In total, we had 19 major risks that resulted in 90% of the fatal incidents we've experienced. And our focus has become absolutely dedicated to those 19 risks. If we can mitigate those, we should be able to cut our fatalities by more than 90% and ultimately to zero across our operations. The next step was to go back to the same leaders and say, what are your controls that you drive? And once again, it was fascinating within the group to discover different people had different controls. Some incredible learnings across some of our operations that had not been carried across to others. Again, we collated this information, we benchmarked it against industry best practice. And from there, we defined the critical controls that will mitigate and stop these risks. And that ultimately led us into defining 19 group minimum standards that we implement across our group. The difficult thing in a company like Sabanya is we have over 80,000 employees. How do you embed this across 80,000 employees? And there we adopted a, a process that in fact BHP had followed a few years ago. And what we came up with was a personal commitment. And I'm holding mine here. It's a booklet that includes our 19 group minimum standards, all of the controls that need to be followed. But more importantly, there's a personal safety message in this booklet. And there's mine. It's a picture of my family. That's why I practice safety. I've signed this book, booklet as a commitment. My family signed it as a commitment. And we drove this out across our entire organization. It's not compulsory. It is purely, purely voluntary to sign this booklet once you commit to safety personally. And today I'm extremely proud to say that more than 98% of our employees have signed up to their personal commitment for safety. But how you implement it becomes increasingly difficult. Again, how do we drive these controls? That has to be done through data. We audit our controls, we've set up auditing procedures to understand are these controls being implemented? Where are they failing us? Where are they not working? And from that we could come up with a gap analysis. To use an example, some of our controls might be engineering, might take time to implement them. Level 9 PDS, VDS systems, proximity detection is our minimum standard. Where we do not have it, we then put a plan in place to implement that control. And in our company today, you can go down to an individual workplace where every single individual workplace has got their own fatal elimination plan. That's not a soft plan, it's a hard plan with distinct targets, measurables and deliverables to close that gap with our critical controls. And that's how we've driven it and made every single employee in our company part of this journey. Lest we forget, the journey doesn't end there. This is a virtuous circle. We need to keep going around and around and improving that from learnings all of the time. I think a key aspect that we've heard of being touched on today is behavior. Having the controls in place is one aspect of the program. The other aspect is how we behave. And more importantly, how do we monitor that behavior? And we developed a fair and just behavior model, which we use during our learning from incidents, which I'll touch on that now. And broadly speaking, we can split this into three. Very often with our incidents, what we find is the behavior that resulted in an incident was unintentional. It was a slip, a lapse, or a mistake. And how you deal with that type of behavior is not through disciplinary action. That's through training. That's through mentoring and coaching. That's through awareness in the workplace. The middle box of behaviors is where it becomes cultural. And I'll go back to my comment earlier on the wink-wink culture where we find that everybody within a workplace is disregarding the controls we have in place. That is the accountability of a manager, of a leader, to drive that change in culture. You cannot look at individuals if everybody is doing it and place the accountability there. That sits with us as leaders within our company. And then on the far right side is where it does come down to individual decision makings. Very important to understand if somebody is breaking the rules for production gain, why? Has that got to do with bonus systems? Has it got to do with production pressures? How do we address that? And in the extreme case where it is just willful, reckless behavior, and of course that cannot be tolerated and does come with disciplinary action. So a very fair behavioral model that allows us to truly get to the root cause of why people are doing what they're doing and address it in the most comprehensive manner. Learnings, again, I think, is the way we can truly honor our colleagues who we have lost. 
because that can be the contribution to ensuring it doesn't happen again. This has also been a process that has been adopted by the Minerals Council, and we once a month have our learning from incidents across the industry. As a company, we go through a full HPI investigation on every single HPI incident that occurs. And let me explain, we have two sets of HPIs. One is where we have an injury that could have resulted in a potential loss of life. And one is where we have an incident. So there was no injury, but it could have also resulted in a loss of life that we call IPLL and NIPP, NIPLL. Every single one of those incidents goes through an extensive review. We understand the cause of the incident. We understand the behaviors that led to it. And from that learning, we go back and test our critical controls. Were they correct? Can we enhance them? Was it a behavioral issue or are our controls not delivering what we expect? And from there, we can continue to improve on them through corrective actions and learnings. That gets summarized into a report, a detailed report, which is shared with the executive and ultimately summarized into a one pager that we call the NFI report on a weekly basis. That is a one page on that incident that gets the key learnings that need to be distributed across the entire group. And every Friday, those NFI pages are emailed across the entire group and all managers are expected to work through those and implement the learnings that came out of those in their own areas. Again, I dare say as leaders, this is often where we stop. And that's not enough, our job is not done. Our job is to make sure that those learnings are in fact implemented. And if not, why not? And how do we enable our people to be able to implement those learnings? So we have detailed trackers. And actually on a monthly basis, understand, has it been closed out? Have those learnings been implemented? And if not, what do we need to do to enable you to do that? I think Craig very aptly mentioned the importance of leading indicators. We tend to look at lagging indicators. Lagging indicators are like a rear view mirror in our car. They are excellent to tell us the journey we've been on and whether or not we're improving or not. They are very poor at being able to manage a business. To manage safety, you need leading indicators. And we have several. But today I've picked the three that I personally focus on within our company. The first one, again, I've heard it being touched on, is stoppages by frontline crews and supervisors. When we started this journey and started measuring this, it came as a bit of a shock to us that under 20% of our total safety stoppages were by frontline crew and supervisors. 80% were by safety officers, managers, inspectors from the DMPR, uh, and technical supervisors. Only 20% were from our frontline crew. This goes to the heart of the culture of the company, it goes to the heart of Section 23 and your right to withdraw from an unsafe area. In order to have crews stopping, and the question was asked, what do you need? You need a crew that's competent, can recognize risk. You need a crew that feels safe to be able to stop that work and is not going to be victimized. And you need a culture amongst leadership and supervisors that will embrace and reward stoppages, not punish it. Those were three big levers that we focused on and had to change. We set ourselves a very ambitious target of 80%. And I'm extremely pleased today to say that where we are today is just shy of that target. And more than 75% of our safety stoppages today are coming from frontline crew and supervisors, which means we are catching incidents before they happen and quicker than it would take for stoppages by management or senior supervisors who only visit areas peri periodically. The second key one is near misreporting. And again, I think this talks to the culture. How do you get comfortable to report a near miss incident? That was something we had to drive hard. And as you can see from the graph on the bottom left, we've seen a significant improvement in this, again, rewarding people for reporting incidents. What we've also tracked is the severity of those in incidents. So are they incidents that could have resulted in a loss of life? And pleasingly, we've seen that trend coming down. So despite the increase and the comfort and the psychological safety of being able to report it, the high risk incidents are being reduced through our fatal elimination program. But the last one on the bottom right, I dare say, is the graph that should keep every single one of us awake. And when we started tracking this, as a leadership team, we went cold. This tracks the actual incidents we have in our operations, not the lagging indicators or the fatals. The actual incidents we have that could have resulted in a fatal. And you can see when we started tracking this at the beginning of 2023, we were having up to 40 incidents across our operations that could have been fatals, 40. Let us allow that to sink in. I dare say when you look at this type of risk in your operations and you look at the track record we've got, 
that makes the lagging indicators think we were lucky. This we have to address. This is what measures risk and is the key driver for us as a company is driving down those incidents. And while we've made a significant improvement to still be having 10 incidents a month across our operations that could result in fatals, keeps me awake at night. That number has to become zero. So looking at the lagging indicators to ask if we've made a difference, I think a very interesting trend there is that despite the fact that we focused on only high energy and eliminating fatals, we've seen the benefit in the lower energy incidents. We've seen our tripper rates almost half, and in fact they are getting very close to ICMM norms, telling us that the South African industry, deep level, labor intensive, can compete with international mining companies on the safety front. We have seen a significant reduction in our fatal incidents, but I dare say until that number is zero, we have not got to where we need to be on our milestone and we are not anywhere close to achieving zero harm. So what is the next step for us to get to zero? And again, I think Craig made some excellent comments regarding culture. And for us, this is about a values-based decision-making journey. I've made the comment at the bottom. I think we often hear in business circles that culture eats strategy for breakfast. You can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have the right culture in your company, you'll never deliver it. Well, here I've used it to say culture eats engineering for breakfast. You can have engineered out the best risks, but if you do not have a culture that's going to adopt those engineering risks, that are going to adopt your critical controls, your critical behaviors, and your critical management routines, they mean nothing. This is the final step that we have to embrace if we truly want to eliminate fatalities, and it has to be done by all of us collectively. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but the journey we are busy with now is together with our employees, defining what are those behaviors that are linked to our values. How do we behave when we're not being watched? And ultimately, how do we make safety not just an operation at work, but something that is embedded in our daily lives? And again, I truly believe if we can get this right, the South African industry can become a zero fatal industry. And that has to be our goal and commitment of everybody in this room today. Thank you very much, Kroger. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Richard Stewart from Savannah Still Water. We'll take one question from the floor and one question online. We'll, I've noted you, sir, for one question on the floor. And if there's nothing online, we'll take a second question from the floor. Can I have a roving mic in this row, please? Thank you. This is the 2024 Mine Health and Safety Summit. And the theme for our summit this year is innovate and elevate breaking boundaries to achieve zero harm. Our hashtags innovate to elevate 2024 MHSC summit mission zero harm. You can go ahead when you're ready. When you ask your question, please stand so that the team can see you and then you can introduce yourself. When Thank you're ready, you very sir. much. Uh, good morning, all. Um, my question, my questions are, are actually based on uh, uh, accident incident investigations. You just mentioned something important about the near misses. So the first question is, how do you define the near miss? What are the near misses that are, uh, your, your, your team is supposed to report? Because uh, we can say you report the near miss. Then uh, one will say, no, this is not a near miss. But my question is, how do you define the near miss? The second question, um, and uh, on the near miss, do you investigate those near misses? Do you have a, a, a report and then uh, uh, the action plan? And then how do you uh, uh, get rid of, of, of that to prevent the reoccurring sexual? The last question is the, in terms of accident incident uh, uh, reporting. Uh, we've got a challenge actually whereby um, management uh, are using the, the accident investigations as a tool to dismiss or to punish our people. So uh, to such an extent that the people are no longer being honest when coming to reporting the accident and uh, during the 11-5, uh, they don't actually give us the, the honest truth what transpired during the accident. So how do you deal with that? How do you address that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me try and make sure I try address all three of your questions there. Thank you very much. Listen, I think they're key questions. 
Um, can you start off with how do you try and capture your misses? And I think there was a question asked earlier as well around how do you encourage a frontline crew to stop? And it's a similar, similar process. I think what we had to accept is that you don't need to try and define what is in your miss. Absolutely any incident that could or may be in your miss needs to be reported. And it will then be determined whether or not that was in fact and what the severity of it was. I think similar to how we drove the stoppages amongst frontline crew, there was huge concern amongst our management when we implemented that to say, well, we're going to get stoppages that aren't legitimate. They shouldn't be stopped. How do we know what's going to be stopped? Is it in fact right? And the answer was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If somebody stops, we embrace it. If somebody reports it, we embrace it. As we go down this journey and this learning becomes better, so it will get better. And interestingly, when we did it, we took about a quarter of a significant production loss as a result of those stoppages. But very quickly that learning spread and the fact that stoppages were embraced it became part of our culture. But we had to make that investment to get there. So it's not about trying to classify what is or is not in your miss. If you're not sure, report it, we embrace it. Red, I think we've got a saying, red is our friend. We want to know where things are going wrong. If we don't know, we can't address it. And I'd rather have 100 incidents reported that are not necessarily serious incidents than have 10 that should have been reported and would have allowed us to address it than not. I think in terms of the, the learnings in, in investigations, um, and sorry if I, if I understood your question correctly, how do we go through those learnings with regards to the behavioral model? I think the behavioral model is key in terms of how and where, if there is disciplinary action required, how and where it's, it's uh, appropriately applied. And as you can see, I think what we found was that in so many of our high potential investor investigation um, reports, we often stop at the last step. What was the last step that happened? It's normally the individual who got injured who made a mistake, and that is where we stop, and that's where the blame sits. The point of that behavioral model is to step right back and say, but let's ask the question, is this the only individual who made that mistake, or is it being done routinely across the organization? If it's being done routinely, you cannot hold that individual to account. Then you need to hold management to account. And that is where disciplinary action occurs if it has to. If it's a mistake or a slip or a lapse, then it's about training. If it does sit in that end box where there is willful recklessness, then disciplinary action is taken. And we have to take that disciplinary action for the safety of the other members in the team. I hope I've addressed all three of your questions. Sir. Is it true? Hello? Thanks, Dr. Stewart. We'll take a second Sorry. question. We don't have anything online. If you can please stand and introduce yourself. I can hear someone speaking. Hello, I'm Liv Mamajani. I'm morning from Amku. Uh, thank you very much with the presentation. My question is, you, you didn't have the good year in 2018 and I think it's 20, 2021 until you came with the strategy of how do you deal with the issue of reducing the fatalities and the accidents. Sorry, so, do you, uh, sorry, can I just interrupt? Do you mind standing? The cameraman is searching for you. He cannot find you. Please stand. At the far back. You would like to see on you. your left. I think on your left hand oh, side. Oh, I see. Far back. Yeah. Or should I climb the seat? No, we can see. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, the question is, after 2018 and 2021, you had a strategy of the booklet that includes giving the family members or the, the photo of the family members. And I just want to ask, I'm interested in the booklet that you guys have. What does the booklet entail inside? Does it have the... the Section 23, Section 83, in terms of employees removing from a dangerous working place, does it protect the employees in terms of being victimized? I thank you. Uh, th th thank you very much. And listen, I think that's a really important question um, because what we've got to define is what this booklet is and what this booklet isn't. This booklet is a personal commitment to safety and is designed to help our employees understand the strategy we are on and I'll unpack what's in it at the moment. What this booklet is not, it is not a tool for discipline. 
and that is why it's voluntary to sign up to. This is not a tool to be able to say, you made a commitment, now why didn't you follow it? That is not what this booklet is designed for. So what is contained in here? Yes, the right to withdraw, and it is a, a global booklet. We've rolled this out across all of our operations. So it's not specifically Section 23 in terms of the South African uh, Act, but the principle of the right to withdraw from an unsafe area is absolutely contained in here. What is contained in here is our 19 group minimum standards, the controls of each of those standards that will mitigate them happening, the behaviors that need to be conducted that will mitigate them happening, and the expectations of management and the routines management has to follow to mitigate them from happening. What is also in here is a personalized section that refers to the family, as you mentioned, or any item. Anybody could choose why do they want to stay safe? What's their reason for staying safe? And the other personal item in here relates specifically to your job, where you can go and say, these are the three or four or five group minimum standards applicable to my job, and I know what controls I need to be following to mitigate the risk. So I think critically important for this to be a success, this is not a legal, a regulatory uh, commitment that's going to put you in term disciplinary action. This is a personal commitment that aligns our organization with the objectives we're trying to achieve, which is eliminating fatal incidents. Thank you. Thank you very much.